<laughs> okay, I'll take only one more. I won't be able to eat. Thank you very much, Krista. Where's my girlfriend? Oh, there she is. Yeah. <laughs> Hold me now, all right? Okay. I just wanted to find out where you and me now was. Come on. That's another show. <laughs> okay. Can I just hold this up, please? Oh, just. Uh. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm, I'm the original J Lo. I'm, I'm older than she is, okay? Johnny, when you were a young singer of Cost Entering the Eurovision, what were your hopes and aspirations? Going to that first contest, and could you ever foresee that your name would be linked with Eurovision? No. The next no. To be honest, um, the Eurovision I grew when the Eurovision I grew up with was a, a gateway. The only really way, the only way for someone in more middle of the road, um, unless you were in a rock band in Ireland, you went and lived in London, like Thin Lizzy or bands like this. Um, Eurovision was the way for someone like myself to open a door into Europe to try and get in a career that spanned outside of Ireland, which has, much as I love Ireland, has three and a half million people. It doesn't take long to do the circuit, you know? And um, when I went into it, it really wasn't about fame when you went in. I mean, the first song that I went in with, What's Another Year, was originally a country song. And I heard it sung, it was sung by a guy called Jim O'Neill, who was a DJ with RTE. And because he was working for RTE, they thought it was incestuous, they, he was not allowed to sing in the contest. And then I think they wanted a country singer called Glenn Curtin to sing it, and he didn't want to do it because he didn't believe in the song. And then the song was offered to me. And uh, it just happened that at the same time, there was a young musical director called Bill Whelan who was making a name for himself. And Bill did the musical arrangement for it. And there was a young saxophone player from Scotland called um, uh, Colin Tully. And he was playing with the jazz funk band, Cato Bell. And um, it was just one of those freak things where we all came together and it worked. You know, they, uh, Bill went on to write Riverdance. He was the guy who wrote the music for Riverdance and this sort of thing. So it was a lot of uh, talented people at a, at a time, young talent in Ireland that came together at the right time and I was very lucky to be the person that fronted it. Um, but I didn't think about winning the Eurovision. What I thought about doing was actually making the people proud of the job that I did. And the, um, when I sang the song, what um, before the votes came in, Shay Healy said to me, well, you can't have sung it you know, better than you sung it now. And that made me happy. Then I knew I could go home, you know. That's the honest truth. Uh, what did you think when you were asked to take part in the 60th anniversary concert? Did you hesitate in saying yes? Yes, I did. You I did? hesitated quite really? a lot, yeah. For how long? Um, Three seconds? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, this... Why the, well, it's because um, I haven't worked in England for over 20 years. Okay. 20 odd years, and to come here. Welcome back. Thank you very much. <laughs> I haven't worked in England for over 20 years, or Ireland, basically, for over okay. 20 years. Yeah. My, base is, uh, my base is Germany, and yeah. my band all come from Copenhagen, from Denmark. Yeah. And I work um, in Belgium and Holland as well. Main, main, mainland Europe. I think. Um, so, what was behind the decision not to work in the UK? Um, basically, in, 19, thing, in 1980, when I won the Eurovision the first mm -hmm. time, I was in court for four and a half years. All the money was stolen from it. Right. And. Um, you know, I've had some horrific experiences after 1980 and trying to get records played, follow-ups played. Um, there was a big musician strike and when the musician strike came back, Top of the Pops came back on, that was one of the shows that was lost. And uh, before it went on strike, the uh, programme had a rule where you were allowed, the, the, the last number one had an automatic slot on Top of the Pops. So they had a song like Save Me, which I didn't believe in. Yeah. I didn't really want to record. but. Um, you know, it's very hard when you're 24 years old and you're alone in the between five, six managers telling you to do it. Mm. And I recorded it, it was, uh, cut a long story short, didn't work. Uh, the radio stations wouldn't play it. And when the, pro when the strike came back, that rule was done away with. So Top of the Pops wouldn't do it. So all of the ways. And then it became an uphill struggle to make my career work. Right. And in 87, when I won the second one, I saw the same thing happening again. So I left Sony England and went to Sony Germany okay. and established myself there. And that was the honest reason why I did it. The thing was... Okay. Um, I found that there was a, a prejudice, maybe prejudice is the wrong, the wrong word, you weren't taken seriously. 
I didn't fit by the UK. By the UK, by the, UK, um, by the, by the UK, establishment, not by the people. No, I would never. I would never take, the, you know, like, you know, make 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 that generalisation. I wouldn't say this, but certainly, I mean, in '87, there were ads on the underground from Capital Radio saying the artists they wouldn't play, and they included Whitney Houston, Michael Bolton, myself, okay. among others, and uh, you know, so what, what? You know, why why go and bang your head off a wall? Yeah. You know, this was, I was 30 years old, 31 years old, and, uh, you know, Germany welcomed me with open arms, and the Central Europe, and I made a, a you know, like I've sold an awful lot of records, mm -hmm. something in the region of 16 million, mm -hmm. and I've, um, my last four albums have been in the charts all over Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. Last year I had a number one single over in, um, and I'm working on another album at the moment, mm -hmm. touring uh, constantly. Last year was probably one of the busiest I've had in my career. Mm -hmm. So you were asking me why did I hesitate when I was yeah, coming back in? Well, because that. basically, you know, I don't work here. Yeah. I don't have anything to promote. Okay. And you know, like my experience with the, the press has not been, you know, one of the I best. Hope we're nice you know, that's no, that's well, it hasn't been. You know, like it's, I'd be lying in Ireland or in England, and I found that, uh, okay. you know, it's not something that I have to put up with. So okay. I, I choose not to. Yeah. Nice um, answer. Thank you. It's the truth. Yeah. I, I don't no, don't any point no, in lying to no, you, no, man. No, no, you know. No. How would you compare the Eurovision stages that you performed in your era compared to the stages? I think it's it's very race. reflective of where music is now. I think in in eighty, I loved the orchestras. I loved the dignity of the orchestra. I mean, I still get into trouble. I know you were with the EBU people earlier on, and I still get into trouble with the EBU for going on about the orchestras. But the orchestras, for me, at a certain added a certain sense of occasion. This show tonight. One of the things that did actually convince me to do it was the band working, real musicians playing, and not being asked to with the backing track. They are so, and the, you know, the, the musicians are so great, but they bring live music will always bring the best out of an artist if you can sing. Um, the feeling of watching a conductor start up an orchestra and people shifting in their seats before you start singing is something that I wish an awful lot of artists today could experience. Touring with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra was one of the highlights of my career, singing for the Queen of England mm -hmm. under the baton of, um, with David Bell and Al, um, Alan Ainsworth, under the baton of Alan Ainsworth, who used to be the, uh, God rest their souls, they're both gone now. But um, those were, the high, for me, the highlights of my career. I learned more in England mm -hmm. from the likes of David Bell and Alan Ainsworth mm -hmm. that have stood me in good stead and allowed me to have the career that I've had, and I will always be grateful to England for that. And I'll be always, you know, um, remember my time here and the work that I've done with a great sense of pride as I will remember my three Eurovisions but where the Eurovision is now is reflective of where the music industry is um, nowadays the biggest TV shows you have are X Factor and The Voice and Pop Stars the Eurovision is a backing track show so coming on to how Eurovision is now how do you feel RTE's selection process I is think now? it's rubbish and I think it's an think I, I think I, I think the entry this year is great yeah I think she's a lovely not on yes I think she, I think it's the it's I'm not sure it's the strongest song in the world, okay. but I think the girl is she's beautiful, she's a lovely lady. voice, and I think that it's um, we're going back to what we used to do well, which is sing a song. You know, and we're not, we're, you know, the, um, no disrespect to Jedward or the other people, they, they, they fit into yeah, a category. Yep, yeah, that's the more pop option. And I, I've always felt that Ireland is better with the sort of more the real thing. Um, and I think they've gone back to that. And I, I, really, I really hope for the sake of music in Ireland that this girl does well this year. But I do think. Um, that Ireland turned the Eurovision selection into a farce years ago when they changed it into Eurostar. They changed it into a kind of ex pop stars and things like this. And they used to end up with two singers from different parts of Ireland competing against either other mm. and no song. Mm. And the reality of it is it's a song contest. You find a song and then you get the singer to sing it. So they were putting the cart before the horse. I feel that, um, you've asked the question so I'll answer it. Um, I feel that Ryan Tuberty, who presents the uh, the Late Late Show, which he's done on, is wonderful. I think he's great at the Late Late, but the Eurovision Song Contest, the selection process, should be nothing to do with the Late Late Show. It should be the way this, you look at, I was in Scandinavia on the, for the fourth heat, I was doing a gig in, um, in Sweden, in, uh, I can't remember the name, it's Vecchio, Vecchio. I'm sort of, a, did, that, did I get that right? Almost. Vecchio, and um, I saw the guy that went on to represent, uh, who's going to be representing Sweden. Yeah. And the graphic illustrations around him are absolutely unbelievable. And Mons is his name. Uh, you know, the, the effort that is put into the Swedish Song Contest and the Scandinavians into the presentation and the selection is something that everybody could take a leaf out of. At the end of the day, the Eurovision, you can slate it, you can say whatever you want. I'm a very proud Irishman. 
And I think that something goes outside of Ireland that carries the name of Ireland deserves for you know the rest of us to feel proud of it as well. And I really dislike what they have done with that that in Ireland in general. We're lucky enough that we've had the likes of you two, Van Morrison, Gary Moore, Tim Lizzie, you know, Phil Lennon. Um, you know, you may not cry like Christopher or me, but we've all been successful, you know, like on different levels. And, um, you know, um, you look at the influence that the Irish music has had abroad, even the written word, the likes of Oscar Wilde and George Bernard Shaw and things yeah. like this. For such a small country, we've had such an influence in the arts. Mm -hmm. It's something that we should, we've always been very proud of. And I think that uh, certainly the powers that be, and not the people, the powers that be, have let the country down yeah. in the last 15, 20 years. There was a great rumour in the early 90s where Ireland just kept on winning it and kept on winning it and they were going... That wasn't a rumour, that was a fact. <laughs> they were saying, it's bankrupting the country. Oh, that's rubbish. Have you just asked the EBU, that's rubbish. You know, this is, I've got all that. And the reason that RTE can still do TV shows is we won the Eurovision, we paid for the cameras. Um, that's rubbish. I think sort of, you know, it's a bit like England saying that they don't want to win the Eurovision Song Contest. Maybe some people don't, but I guarantee there are people involved in the... The, uh, the staging of this TV show that would love to have the Eurovision here. They'd love to have it in England. Yeah, I know, but this is, but you know, but that's the same thing as saying it in Ireland. I mean, the people want to win it. You know, like the thing is, I do remember going to the Eurovision in 87 and being told by somebody from RTE very high up, I hope you come a close second. I do remember that. But you know, the thing is that the reality of it is that um, the benefits from winning it, the focus the following year, on your country and your and your you know the, the stuff that's in your country, the tourism in your country alone. I mean, um, Ireland is just coming. We're coming out of a terrible recession and terrible sort of um, financial hole that we we've, we've dug ourselves into. And um, anything that's going to you know like bring people back in and we can sell Ireland for what it you know the best part of Ireland, which is our people and our country. Um, that's always been you know like the the best sellable thing that we've ever had from Ireland, our young people and our country. And um, our sense of humour. <laughs> and uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, no, I'm please. Sorry. I was just like, given some of your reservations, do you still get quite involved in like watching the show and going along? No, I never did. Never did. No, no I did. I, 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 that's I've always found that a kind of a little bit embarrassing, because because I've won the song contest three times, people ask me, like I'm this big knowledge fountain of knowledge about the Eurovision. <laughs> I, but I'm not. I mean, I just I won it. I didn't I didn't vote for the songs. I won it. Yeah. I sang them. You know, the thing is, it's are not one of the songs that I won with. Did I ever write for the Eurovision? I mean, Hold Me Now. I wrote in Wandsworth Common um, at a time, and the reason I wrote what Hold Me Now was because I was with a record company, and the songs they kept giving me gave me, you know, they were effortless. There was nowhere to go vocally on them. There was no register, and nobody was writing songs that would push me vocally. So I decided to try and write for myself, and Hold Me Now was my second attempt. And uh, um, I brought it to who was then my manager in London, and he uh, very ungraciously told me that I should put my pen away and he would choose the music that I would sing, and I should uh, forget trying to write songs. And I held that song for two years, and it won the Eurovision that was 85, and it won the Eurovision in 87. And it's uh, still making me a lot of money today. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, you'd be very young then, you know. I'm not, I'm not Some of us are 60, you know, okay. <laughs> um, have you heard the entry from the UK? I just heard it very briefly um, on the way in. What were your thoughts on it? I, I, um, be honest. And to be honest, I think, it, you know, like sort of, uh, it kind of like, you know, like sort of that like good time jazz. Kind of, I kind of got a gangster feel of it, you know, when I was coming in. But I, I, I really, um, I think one of the best things that could happen to the Eurovision would be for England to win it. But I, you know, um, I think that uh, I think it's going to take a really good song to win it because there's a certain amount. England has joked about the Eurovision for so many years and held it in so much disdain from a press point of view, from um, from that point of view, that I think to reverse that situation and to win it is going to take another thing like Love Shine a Light or something like this, Katrina or one of those. And I think that. Uh, that would be the best thing that could happen to the Eurovision because I think um, if the English people take it seriously, you still have some of the finest songwriters, producers and musicians in the world and will always have coming out of this country. This is the country that gave us the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, um, and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, <laughs> and Jerry and the Pacemakers. And why am I mentioning all bands from the 60s and the 70s? Well, says, I'm into the Black Keys these days, most of my bands are American. Do you, do you think that's, uh, that's an endemic problem with the British music industry, that I songwriters think are, are very much pushed into the 
I think no, that's not just that. That is just. For the voice, for, yeah, I don't there's, think. There's a control going yeah, on I don't think. I think that uh, the whole music industry has changed, and yeah. I think something is going to have to change it. Otherwise, it, it can't exist. Yeah. If musicians and songwriters and artists don't receive money for their work, yeah. they can't reinvest in it, mm. and um, you can't have a future in the music industry. I've got a 22-year-old son, yeah. who's in his fourth year of a degree in music in, in Dublin in BIM. So I'm very aware of this. Um, you know, if you saw the returns, I'm sure you're aware from streaming mm. and from Spotify for artists, it's a joke. Yeah, it's a joke. And the thing is, until if, if that doesn't change, mm. um, record companies are becoming irrelevant mm. because shows like X Factor <coughs> and Pop Stars, they they do the job of a record company. Mm. Their promotion departments, they're like sort of, you know, people see the artist, the winner. Like sort of, you get the uh, they're seen. The videos are done because you've seen them crying on stage, all yeah. you know, all the whole, the whole thing and that. And um, but the problem with that is that three months later or the next Eurovision, it's like the next. I mean, I was asked already, you know, about um, last year. I did a clip for the Copenhagen, and people were asking me, sort of, well, would you be interested in doing something at the Eurovision this year? Mm. I'd be very interested in playing a gig mm. during the week of the Eurovision. But the night of the Eurovision is not about the old farts like me, you know, the people that have won the Eurovision. Mm. The night of the Eurovision is about the new winner and Conchita handing over the crown. Mm. And it's got nothing to do, you know, like to be seen to be trying to hang on the coattails of the Eurovision would be embarrassing for me um, as an artist. And I think that that would be the wrong thing for me to do. I'd love, I mean, I'd love to be there to see it, but, um, mm. you know, I'm probably working now in my schedule, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. And back to orchestra and conductors, how did you feel on stage just before that? person that was about to strike out in the orchestra. What's the emotions you That's were the greatest cure for constipation that you've ever had in your life, man. <laughs> it's no, it's because that's basically, you know, like, I don't care, you know, like, I've never been one of these people who doesn't get nervous before they sing. I, I shake like a leaf, you know, like, I've actually got physically sick before I go on. You know, even at the rehearsals, I mean, if I was, you asked me, you asked me to sing here, I get nervous. But the thing is that maybe that's why I still really care very much about how I perform. And maybe that's because the the music industry or being my dad was a singer he died when he was 69 he was an irish tenor and singing was something that i grew up with and it was some it was something that a noble thing to become it was something you know to be you know that you should work to be the best you could be you know like sort of the, we had examples like Smokey robinson marvin Gaye, like sort of uh, robert plant you know robert palm people like this um and i think that sort of the longevity of the artist at that time allowed you to think of the music industry as as a life um, and you always want to be the best you can be so when that first note starts what's going through your head is not the first note it's the whole three minutes in that song you know that and um, that's why that watching the conductor and the people moving in the seats was so important because it was almost like a trigger you know like uh, something just bang and then you you were ready f you know you went into a different zone you you really you did and um, it was over, and I, I still find it very hard to remember certain parts of each song to this day. Do you ever forget the lyrics of the song? Oh, yeah. I did a great, I did sang in the Belgium National Song Contest in Ostend after Hold Me Now. And I was singing Hold Me Now, and it was live with an orchestra again. And I sang the first two verses in the chorus, and then I went for the third verse, and I got a complete blank. So I made up a verse. And I was walking out down this ramp, and the girls, there were girls sitting, I remember, on the right-hand side, and they were singing the right verse, and I was singing the wrong, and they, you know when they started off, they had the smiles on their face, then there was this huge kind of confusion, <laughs> what is he singing? And then I got the chorus back, and I'm, yay, okay, it's okay, but I mean, it is, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's those, those moments of embarrassment are what keep your feet on the ground, those and your kids, you know. You're used to doing interviews. What's the most unusual question you've ever been asked? Uh, the first, the one I got after I did Hold Me Now, after I won Hold Me Now, um, I, would, I haven't had a drink for about 10 years, stopped drinking a few years ago. But um, when I won the second Eurovision, I was sitting, um, there was a documentary being done by Irish television, and I was sitting backstage and the camera was on me. And a girl called Avril McGorry was in charge of RTE. And being Belgian, there were two magnums of champagne in, in buckets at every table. And I was sitting with a friend of mine, Mustafa, who was a Turkish guy as well. And uh, the first two or three votes, you know, we just got a normal score. And then the 12 started happening. And I got a panic attack. I just thought, I can't handle this. I've got to leave. You know, I didn't think of the logic of it. I just said, I've got to leave. 
and Avril said, somebody give him a glass of champagne. And I, so I had a glass of champagne and then another glass of champagne. And <laughs> every time I got 12, I had another glass. And I got a lot of 12s, you know. And uh, the press conference afterwards, you know, like the first question I was asked was not, Johnny, what's it like to win the Eurovision second time? What's it like to win the Eurovision, you know, um, with your own song? The first question I was asked, I was sort of was, uh, Johnny, are you gay? And before I could stop myself, I said, I'm not, but my boyfriend is. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, but I've always been somebody who doesn't think things through. It's like even the questions that you're asking now. I answer them as honestly as I can. And I have a sense of humour, which is quite dark and gets me into trouble sometimes. You say your son's 22. My, that's my baby. Your baby boy. It's 2022. Okay. My eldest son is 35 and my middle one is 30. Wow, good spread. Yeah. Um, I got home occasionally. Okay. <laughs> Students are really massively into throwing parties for Eurovision night. It's sort of become a bit of a culty thing to get all your mates around, drink drinks from the country. I think that's great. But that's what it used to be like. And that's, you know, and that's what it should be like. And you shouldn't be taking, you know, like, oh, I don't like that song because the bridge section isn't right. Or this sort of, you should go and have a laugh, enjoy yourself, think the song is funny or this one is good or whatever. Or it's a bit like, you know, I go to the races, to horse racing. But I wouldn't know that one end of a horse from the other. The only thing I know about horse racing the horses was in 1980 after uh, I won with what's another year Shergar was kidnapped by a terrorist organization or something like this in Ireland it was a very famous racehorse and seemingly this is true there's a documentary done a kind of a play on it and Shergar um, whoever kidnapped it had a meeting with a guy in a in a pub in Wicklow in the mountains and the code word for the meeting was Johnny Logan <laughs> And I just saw a picture and this bald guy behind the bar and the guy walks up and says, Johnny Logan. He says, Johnny Logan. And that's about as much as I would have in common with horses apart from I live in, a, you know, my, uh, uh, in Ashburn in, um, just outside of Dublin. It's very famous for horse racing. So your message, yeah, to your, yeah. Sorry. your message for people watching Eurovision this year is just enjoy it. Then. Enjoy it. It's a TV show. I mean, that's sort of, you know, just it's, it's, you know, nobody dies to the best of my knowledge, you know. Johnny, yes. nobody has sung for us this afternoon. Would you sing yeah, for us, yeah. please? <laughs> my young love said to me, my father won't mind. And my mother won't slight you for your lack of kind. Then she moved closer to me, and this she did say. It will not be long, long, long love. Till our wedding day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.